Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Sequoia Miller, and I am the Chief Curator and Deputy Director at the Gardner Museum. Thank you for joining us today for our Gardner Signature Lecture Series, the Helen E. Gardner Lecture. You will notice your mics and videos are muted and the chat option has been disabled. There will be a Q&A following today's program, so we invite you to send your questions through the Q&A function at any point. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that for thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Petun, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The community we work in is the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to learn and live on this land. Today, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Adrian L. Childs, who will be presenting her lecture titled Race and Ornament, Seeing the Black Body in 18th Century European Porcelain. This lecture considers the fascinating and complex world of 18th century European porcelain and depictions of black bodies, their possible meanings, sources, and afterlives. Dr. Childs is an art historian and curator. She is an adjunct curator at the Phillips Collection and associate of the WBE Dubois Research Institute at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. She curated the exhibitions, the exhibition Rifts and Revelations, African-American Artists and the European Modernist Tradition in 2020 at the Phillips Collection. The exhibition catalog Rifts and Revelations won the 2020 James A. Porter and David C. Driscoll Book Award in African-American Art History. Her current book project is Ornamental Blackness, The Black Figure in European Decorative Arts, forthcoming from Yale University Press. She has had, held fellowships at the Lunder Institute at Colby College Museum of Art, the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, and the Hutchins Center at Harvard University, and also the Clark Art Institute at the David and the David C. Driscoll Center. Dr. Childs is co-curator of the recent exhibition, The Black Figure in the European Imaginary at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College. She contributed to The Image of the Black in Western Art, Volume 5, from Harvard University Press. And she is co-editor of the book, Blacks in European Art of the Long 19th Century, published by Routledge. She also served as the curator at the David C. Driscoll Center at the University of Maryland, where she curated numerous exhibitions of African-American art. I'll add on a personal note that Dr. Child's essay uh, Sugar Boxes and Black Amores, Ornamental Blackness in Early Mice and Porcelain, which was published in uh, 2010 in the book, The Cultural Aesthetics of 18th Century European Porcelain, was personally very impactful for me as, as a young scholar. And I can say it has been a profoundly impactful essay for many people, shaping um, many's thinking about the role of the Black figure in European decorative arts. So it's very exciting for us to be able to welcome uh, Dr. Childs here today, where she can share her current thinking um, on this topic and related topics. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sequoia. I appreciate you inviting me here. And I just want to um, mention briefly your wonderful team that helped to wrangle me, because uh, I am busy. So Sama Kokabi, and Richard Tang um, have been really wonderful. And I, um, I'm really excited to come today to talk about um, my work uh, on porcelain. I'm just to warn everyone, I'm uh, more of an art historian, art and sculpture of 18th, 19th, 20th century, uh, European and African-American, but I came into this decorative arts world um, as something that uh, really piqued my interest when I was looking at uh, 19, doing my dissertation in 19th century Orientalist art, French and uh, French Orientalist art. Um, it was a lot of decorative art that sort of supported some of these ideas that I was thinking through. And I thought, well, why not follow that lead? So that was quite a while ago and I'm still following it. <laughs> and we're going to continue to follow it today. So let me share my screen and we can get going. So, um, 
my talk was originally a race and ornament seeing the black body in 18th century European porcelain. But of course, I never like to stay and do exactly what I say I'm going to do. So I, um, I, I dropped the 18th century because we will be looking at some 19th century material toward the end. Now, we all know, I'm sure that you're on this, uh, this webinar because you're interested in porcelain. So we, you know the story, but you know, you gotta say it again, um, of you know, how European porcelain got going, be, uh, the, the movement, if you will, phenomenon began. And it always starts with mice and porcelain in the 18th century. And by now you know that Augustus the Strong, elector of Saxony shown here on the left in gold and white, porcelain, um, was an, uh, a maniac for porcelain, collecting uh, Asian porcelain, and then um, determined, determined to be the first to uh, produce uh, this magic substance in Europe. And uh, on the right, you're seeing a, at Dresden a photograph that I took at the Museum of the Asian uh, Ceramic Collection. And one of the things that's been fun about doing this project, this book that I've been working on for many years, <laughs> too many, uh, you know, you just can't stop once you start, right? Like Augustus the Strong with the porcelain, can't stop. Um, but one good thing is, one fun thing is being able to travel. And so, um, so he's fascinated with this material. He's determined he's going to have, you know, he's going to be the one to corral a group of people because he didn't do it himself to um, a team, put a team together to crack the code. So of course in 1710, um, they did uh, crack the code to making hard paste uh, porcelain based on the Asian models, Chinese models really. And um, they started producing objects re reflected uh, Augustus the Strong's interests already that he had already developed in Asian porcelain. So there are objects that are inspired by Asian art, objects that are inspired by European a a caricatures of Asian figures like the Cinta Pagoda on the left, and his really fascination with um, animals. Um, so all of this is going on. So th what I'm saying here is that, that the, the whole production of, of, of early my, uh, European porcelain is sort of coming out of this taste of this one individual, a powerful individual at the time. Um, so in my larger study of, note, of, your, of, of, of ornamental blackness, I have noted that the taste, so we were talking about tastes and how it impacts uh, porcelain production in this case, that the, the taste for black figures as ornamental motifs emerges from court culture. So I've been looking into, well, all these objects that ha have black figures on them from silver, porcelain, um, furniture, wood, uh, what, where, what, where do these ideas come from? Where do these figures come from? And, and, and many of the objects are made in the circles of courts and many of them, and I think that they reflect uh, an already existing court aesthetics, court culture, court fascination. In this case, a fascination with this notion of the exotic Moor, who at some point over the 17, 16th, 17th century morphs it into a Black person, because a Moor is sort of a, an idea of someone who could be any kind of your, sort of um, North African um, exotic sort of type uh, that it sort of gets distilled in the, in the arts into this uh, Black individual, particularly in the age of uh, Black Atlantic slavery. At any, way, at any rate, so the aesthetics and the pageantry of the court, in that you'll find fictions of Africanness. Um, it's part of their kind of conception of, of, of rulership of the world. And Africa is part of these four corners of the world, how they conceive of the world. Um, and so in the court of Augustus the Strong, you see him uh, portrayed on the left in a typical portrait of the era. Of course, I don't have the date there, of course, uh, but it's an 18th century portrait um, and with an, an, an enslaved African figure. We know he's enslaved because of his, um, his silver collar, slave collar. This is a typical trope we find in portraiture so, uh, of that time. So it, regarding that, um, it could be that there are African retainers in his court. And I think they were, one of my colleagues calls them African retainers. They could be servants. We might wanna call them slaves, but it's not slavery in the same way that we think of in the Americas. But at any rate, there are black servants in courts uh, at part of the aesthetics of um, difference and exoticism that is part of how courts are animating themselves. But even the, the um, 
Augustus the Strong himself, there were all, lots of pageants and carousels and parades where they would be celebrating power, celebrating um, sort of a command over the four corners of the word, world. At one point, uh, he portrayed himself uh, as an African king, and this is a design in the middle for uh, a, a costume. And here on the right, you have a quadrille, one of these, uh, another pageant that would have included uh, a retinue of Africans as representing um, either they could be representing groomsmen, or they could be representing Africa, there could be all kinds of different ways of catching them. But uh, I'm just showing that there's an aesthetics, an interest in this kind of exoticism of Africa in the court already. And it shows up. Uh, and also, he's really uh, models himself off of Louis XIV's court at Versailles. And this is a very 17th century kind of thing, these pageants. So, uh, and, and this was very much um, part of uh, Versailles to the aesthetics of the court African. Um, and so what happens with those aesthetics? They get subsumed into the material culture of the court, um, along with many other things. But my uh, interest in black bodies makes me focus on that. And there's no um, greater <laughs> um, panorama, if you will, of exotic and, and precious materials uh, fashioned into black Africans than was, is in the Dresden treasury or the green vault. And at this point um, in time, the Green Vault has been, uh, the Dresden Treasury has been a major kind of treasury in Europe for many generations uh, through that court. But uh, Augustus de Strong has a particular taste for, for African figures and um, they turn up in abundance in, in the court. And the one, the piece on the left, Moral with, with Emerald Cluster is probably the most famous, if you will, or infamous of these objects. But we know that as Meissen is being developed alongside these court of uh, these uh, treasury objects um, that are um, made out of much more precious material, even though the, I guess my, the porcelain was considered somewhat precious, but once they figured out how to manufacture it, it, it becomes something else. But it's in conversation with the material culture of the Saxon court. So this field figure of the quote unquote blackamoor, is he a servant, is he a slave? He's certainly serving. He's, he's, a, he's driving camels, he's holding things, he's, he's supporting capitals as the figures on the right. Um, and so these figures um, have sort of analogous or I think influence, if you will, the development of Meissen porcelain um, figures. Um, and one of the, I think, um, important things that um, is kind of baked in, if you will, <laughs> to uh, the Meissen um, um, panorama <laughs> uh, the, uh, is, it, and, and baked into sort of the energy behind Meissen in the 18th century is this notion that you can, uh, uh, an understanding of, of being able to shape the world into porcelain objects, and of course, one of the the, set, the one of the aesthetic um, um, manifestations of this is this the four corners of the globe or the four continents um, porcelain objects that many of you have seen and enjoyed. Some collect, um, and uh, it, it the the Meissen is the first to really put the four continents into porcelain. It's interesting when we started digging into this our little porcelain study group, uh, looking in, well, how long, when did, when, when were four continents kind of presented in, in porcelain or ceramics? It really doesn't come along until, until now, even though, or until the middle of the 18th century, even though the four continents were um, uh, images that go back, uh, you know, centuries. Uh, to, to emblem books that try to to uh, to codify and try to to determine what attributes, what symbols um, are associated with each continent. And what's interesting is the symbols, um, fact or fiction, shape the way you understand the continent and shape the way continents are understood in relationship to one another. So we see here Asia on the left, Africa, Europe, and America. And you know, Africa, um, since she's the one who we're interested in now, um, is associated with the, the elephant, of course, um, and while the animal, then there's wheat, I think there's a, a, a that's broken in this piece, the lion, um, and in and, and, and the natural world. Um, 
And often there's a cornucopia, so there's sort of an abundance of the natural world. And then you look at her in contradistinction to, say, Europe, um, who is associated with um, religion. And she's got a crown on. She, she's got this orb kind of uh, in her hand. She's sitting on um, uh, a globe. Um, it, there's a sort of a command of the world, if you will, um, an understanding of the world through literature. She's sitting on books. So, so there's a kind of um, culture here. There's a paint palette. Um, there's artistry. Um, and so uh, there's a difference between nature and culture that's happening here. It's and also with the Americas, with the, uh, the um, alligator, and then Asia is, is definitely more uh, exotic um, and, ha and, and has more clothes on, if, if you will, like the um, uh, like Europe. So there's, there's, a, there's these relationships among these ideas. And, but these ideas represent the way um, Europeans are considering themselves and sort of categorizing the four parts of the world. And it, it filters into other ways of thinking about porcelain. And uh, the reason I, I also just want to show that um, sometimes these uh, porcelain objects, as you know, are diplomatic gifts. And this piece was commissioned for Tsarina Catherine II um, in Meissen. And once these um, objects get um, fashioned and, and part of the repertoire, they are made consistently throughout the decades. And so you can see a design that started, that was uh, originated in the 1740s, continues to be made, um, sometimes in bigger sizes, et cetera. But what's interesting is to think about um, creating um, a diplomatic gift of, of objects that, uh, you know, show your, sh that determine um, the four continents of the world and giving it to another uh, uh, world leader. Um, there's a kind of an exchange of ownership over these ideas that I think is interesting to think about. Um, but one of the things, so, so what um, are the everyday things? And if you want to call them everyday, even though they're still a rare, rarefied to objects, they're not, uh, haven't gone completely commercial yet in the 18th century, although they're getting more and more widespread. One of the things that Sequoia talked about was my interest in, in, in the uh, sugar bowl. This sugar bowl is what got me into this whole project. I'm not kidding. This one sugar bowl, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about it now, but um, <laughs> she was called Negress with basket. Now, this is not, Negress is not a name that I would choose right now, but I'm putting those, uh, uh, these, these names that were, at least when I published this, uh, the museum was giving them that title. And uh, many of the titles are given by museums because these objects don't necessarily have titles associated with them. And those titles are some another kind of way of thinking about how even museums and collectors consider these objects. But at any rate, uh, immediately what I saw was the association between sugar, blackness, uh, black servitude and not just blackness, slavery, 18th century. Um, now this is created by Meissen. Meissen is selling to other um, European powers and they're very popular in France. And so even if we're going to say, oh, well, the Germans were not involved in slavery, um, the uh, rest of the French powers, uh, um, English powers uh, prior were, you know, the, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese in, in earlier times, every the European powers are very much enmeshed in this um, Black Atlantic world. What is the Black Atlantic world? Europe, Africa, the uh, Americas, uh, the, the uh, West Indies, if you will, um, are all um, part of this uh, economies, uh, trade that that is run and and in the, and what part of the labor engine of course is black labor um, and it's built on enslavement and so um, all of that is baked into these issues around sugar and everyone is aware of it um, and so I thought it was very brash to uh, put a black figure almost almost a kind of callous it seemed callous to me here in, at the time but. Uh, when I'm thinking about it, but of course, during that time period, it would have been accepted. And so this is what, what we start thinking about. How are these uh, items accepted? How are the uh, institutions of things like slavery uh, and its association with uh, sugar um, d crafted into luxury objects like this? Um, and of course, when you, th the way sugar has been represented, the way Black figures have been represented in association with the colonial world, in association with sugar, um, has been um, 
through mainly prints. Uh, you don't see as much in, in the quote unquote fine arts. In, in the, uh, we see those portraits with black figures or other exotic types who are always servants uh, for the most part. There are exceptions in the 18th century. Um, what, we do, what we do find in terms of black labor is through um, um, prints, through travel narratives, uh, that tell us about the backbreaking work of sugar. But of course, sugar is also the conduit for a lot of money into Europe. And it fuels a trade that goes all, circulates all throughout the continent. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's very much a, a sort of controversial subject now as we look back on it. And so that's why these, the sugar bowl to me was very fascinating. Um, and it, it goes to my premise about ornamental blackness that um, that there's a kind of um, um, tension, not just tension, between um, luxury production co and consumption and uh, uh, black labor when it comes to these figures. Um, and of course, why did they even want to have a sugar bowl with a black person attached? Because uh, sugar uh, was at one time, we all know the substance that um, created these figurines, if you will, or sculpture for the for the dessert table. And the dessert table was quite quite the spectacle um, in fine um, dining. This is not your everyday person's dining. So that porcelain comes along and is a viable substance to, to um, replace sugar sculpture. Um, and it's interesting that the sugar bowl then the sugar bowl itself has this black figure. And I couldn't find in Meissen any other sugar bowl with any other figure. Now there are a lot of figures in Meissen porcelain, but I just couldn't find, and that doesn't mean they don't exist, but I couldn't find another figural sugar bowl. So this association between black labor and, and sugar um, is very interesting. And the, prop, the issue is in my bigger study, it's, we find it over and over and over again, the association between black labor and a commodity like sugar, like coffee, like chocolate. Um, but at any rate, the sugar bowl for Meissen became a very popular, if you will, um, design. Uh, model, um, and we, we saw the one with the female figure in the skirt holding a piece of fruit. So she almost looks like a market lady. I don't, I, I and it's, these are figures are not part of the four continent iconography, because uh, that might have been another kind of way of looking at it. Um, and then associating uh, sugar with Africa would, is not necessarily accurate because sugar is not coming from Africa anymore. There were times when sugar came from, uh, well, no, no I'm, I'm lying. Put that out of your mind. <laughs> um, but uh, sugar is coming from obviously the quote unquote new world. And, and, and there's just not a lot to support this notion that these are four continent figures. These are um, quote unquote blackamores, which is a way of, of kind of reducing this black figure down to a fantasy figure and, and, and making it kind of a flat figure. So we don't have to discuss it or think about it anymore. It's just a decorative trope. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to unpack in this work. But at any rate, um, um, these uh, bottle, uh, these these um, bowls are also sometimes meant for sweet meats because sugar bowls often covered. Sweet meat bowls are often uh, are open so that little um, sweets that you can reach your hand in and pick out. And then they're um, crafted and mounted with ormolu and 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 there's they're all they're sort of part of the bigger uh, repertoire uh, of of uh, mycin. So what else? Um, do we have um, besides this, this sugar bowl motif? Um, another commodity is associated with this black mycin figure who I think is a fascinating, this is a fascinating object. Um, I have to say, uh, full disclosure, my grandmother used to collect these figure groups and they were on her mantle. Were they mycin? I don't think so, but maybe. <laughs> um, I doubt it. But at any rate, she did travel in Europe and came back with these objects and they would fascinate me uh, from a little girl. Um, and I just don't know why. And I, I just wish she was here to see me rattling on about it. Um, but uh, they, uh, just like um, some of the other objects, many of the other objects you find crap, uh, distilled into porcelain, some of the other sort of images, they reflect um, you know, the, the uh, spirit of the times. They reflect um, um, ways of, of, of entertainment, sort of trends, 
mutually agreed upon subjects that are, are the source of delight. And so in the Rococo period, um, romance and leisure uh, is a subject that, that is very um, fruitful, I guess, if you will. Uh, you, you think back um, to uh, these scenes of the Fete Galante where uh, aristocratic Europeans in, the, in some cases, in some cases you would even have peasants out there, but um, and, uh, are, are enjoying themselves in the countryside. Um, Watteau, of course, uh, sort of, uh, single-handedly promoted, if you will, this, this kind of um, uh, image. And then Nicolas, Nicolas Lancre as well, um, where you have women with very large dresses. You have animals, you have servants, you have romance, you have delight um, in, in, in these leisure classes. So this is exactly what's happening in uh, Meissen, this Meissen piece that uh, is at the Rijksmuseum. And um, one of the sources claims, and maybe they're, maybe they're right, I'm not saying they're not, that this design on the right is based on this print on the left by Lancre, Dance in a Pavilion. And at first I thought, yeah, right. Um, but I had to look a little closer and you see a, a, a gentleman here that might risk correspond to this man here who we call, who, who's a cam, ca, cavalier. <laughs> um, romancing this woman here you, and in the what what kind of convinced me is right here if you can see it I've got the pointer here there's a young black boy with a little turban on um holding a tray and and because I haven't seen this in person in person I don't know what's on that tray it could be coffee it could be something else um but at any rate there's a black servant and then there's a little dog here so it would be it wouldn't be far-fetched to con to to um conceive of the designer um distilling this scene down to a few essential characters and so we have this scene here which is, is somewhat humorous with a uh, woman and she's she's uh taking chocolate she's having chocolate um because these are chocolate serving um uh you know, porcelain serving uh, bowls. And um, there's a little pug on her, her, her dress, of course, which is typical of that era. Um, and the man who's kissing her hand is, is looking into the pug's eyes and she is looking into the eyes of her black, uh, black and more quote unquote servant, um, which is, is kind of a, um, a, a, a little, I would say, frivolous and kind of a fun thing to think about or, or humorous aspect of, of that. She's, she's looking at her pet and he's looking at the other pet. Um, and so these, the, the servant um, who also has a, a slave collar around his neck um, is, a, is, is, is a typical kind of trope of what you'd see, the, uh, certainly the black servant, but one associated with coffee. Even in the 20th century, and if you go to Germany, you'll see these, uh, uh, the symbol of the cafe more, the black uh, a person who's representing a, a, the coffee industry. Um, and of course, coffee is coming out of the Caribbean, coming out of South America. So these are all associated with black labor in, 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 in sort of a, a, an economic aspect. But when they are filtered into sort of European consciousness here, you, they become um, more exotic types with turbans on. Uh, and often they might be dressed in this kind of livery that speaks to even a century before. So these are kind of court, again, a courtly types that you might find. Um, you might find an analog of actual black court servants because there, we know there were very many, uh, there were many of them. Um, and they were often depicted as young, but you know that they, they, they weren't turned out when they got to be older, but in representations, they're young males and you never really see an adult male in these, in these roles. Um, but the hand kiss, kiss group is one that I think um, is, is um, it shows how um, ornamental blackness filters into even these sort of um, self stylings, uh, uh, the way Europeans conceive of themselves in a courtly manner. Um, and uh, just to hammer this home, um, Here's a painting on porcelain. So we have another porcelain, but it is um, a, a sieve 
a painting um, by Nicolas Pitou after a painting by Van Lo, actually a, car, uh, a, a tapestry cartoon. So that's another um, sort of decorative object that, that uh, in which we find um, imagery. And in this case, um, well, in, in the case before, uh, well, I'm, ah, okay, here we have, European um, or notions of self, right? I just said, so this is their, how they reflect themselves in a courtly manner. Um, and, oh boy, okay, so I'm, um, I skipped this one before. So um, just to hammer home the coffee connection, the coffee has been associated with um, uh, black servitude for a, a century at least. And I just have this, uh, Cavalier and Lady Drinking Coffee uh, from uh, the 18th, uh, 17th century. Uh, this is a print uh, of 17th century life. Um, it's a French print, but um, you still have the same ca uh, uh, characters, the, the Cavalier, the uh, sort of um, the flirtation between the two and the Black servant. And even um, in Carl Van Loo's Sultana Taking Coffee, which is in the overdoors at uh, Bellevue. Uh, and of course, uh, this Sultana is Madame de Pompadour. And this could be a fictionalized servant, but again, this uh, her role there is as a Sultana. And that's when we talk, when we start thinking about how these notions of the exotic like turkery um, are, are areas for um, ornamental um, blackness. Um, so turkery is, is the European, um, or particularly French and, and but, but I think it's more widespread than that, but um, interest in, the, in, in the, the Near East, if you will, uh, Turkey, the Ottoman court, uh, this, there's a sort of an interest at, or a conception that the Ottoman court is parallel to sort of the French court. And there's a diplomatic relations in the, uh, in the 18th century uh, and the 17th century. A and it's a way of filtering through the exotic, um, through this notion of the Turk. Uh, and the Turk is a powerful, powerful force during that time. And there's a real a kind of a powerful rivalry. And why does that matter? Because it's in this sort of umbrella of Turkery, a specific kind of exoticism that we find, again, representations of these black figures. Even in, within the, um, in, in the time where Africans um, are in real time enslaved and laboring in the colonies, how are Africans re represented in Europe as turbaned exotics um, that are associated with uh, Turkey? With Constantinople, or with the uh, with the history of the Ottomans, even with with North Africa, with Egypt, with Algeria, even as we go later on, um, Africans are associated there, and of course, African Black Africans are part of that culture. That is a very sort of um, diverse culture, if you will, and Black Africans are enslaved in in the Ottoman court, uh, and here is a porcelain representation by Furstenberg. Um, of uh, what we call Sultan and more. And it's derived from another representation um, of a travel narrative that, that really depicted actual characters. And so um, I was listening to a talk the other day um, about this piece. And of course I had already written it for my book but since the book is not published, we didn't know that. But <laughs> at any rate, um, that this piece actually represents an actual person, uh, which is very unusual in terms of black people. This piece represents Kisla Agassi, uh, who was the black, you know, that, that is the, their, um, their title is Kislar. Um, and that's the, un the high eunuch in the court. Um, and the un a eunuch is a servant, but the eunuch is also a very powerful person in the court. And we know that the Ottoman court had, um, uh, black eunuchs were um, revered in some ways in the Ottoman court. And so you find it um, being translated here into uh, Furstenberg uh, porcelain. So this interest in under understanding the world through, um, through these kinds of characters, um, these exotic characters is where we will also see, if you will, uh, the black figure. Um, um, and, and of course, this is the actual print that is that the this work is based on. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time um, 
I mi- I skipped over one piece piece of it, but that's okay. We're gonna we're we're gonna go on because I'll I'll end up going long anyway. So what we've been looking at was references that hint at slavery or more than hint at slavery, like the sugar bowl, the coffee more, or the the uh, the servant serving a, a, com- a commodity. So so these are black people associated with commodities that are part of um, the slave economy coffee and sugar. Uh, we've looked at sort of um, fantasies of, of blackness through turkery um, or, or rerouting, the rerouting of the, the real relationship with the Europeans and uh, black people, which was in this uh, fraught uh, black Atlantic quagmire. Um, as opposed, but, but they be re- rerouting those relationships through these fantasies of Turkery or in the 19th century orientalism. Um, and, and, and very rarely looking at actual slavery, um, especially in something that is supposed to be as whimsical in, in many ways and delightful um, and entertaining as porcelain. But here is a very surprising piece uh, in the late uh, of the late 18th century, by Doccia, which is an Italian um, uh, a manufactory, and it was um, up for auction recently and, and acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. As shocking, shocking, um, in my opinion, um, piece because um, it's very rare that you find this kind of uh, um, depiction of an enslaved person. Um, in European uh, porcelain, um, but and, and and just to you know to hammer that home, we we do have I do I have found many images and objects that show chained black bodies in decorative arts, particularly uh, guéridon or stands, um, that show blacks chained to the stand, which is a reference obviously to to the enslavement. Uh, but it's it's less prevalent certainly in in porcelain. So here you have an emaciated, in some ways, this face emaciated black figure, grimacing face, hands behind the back, as you see on the right, very st- thin but still quite muscular. So there's a, a reference to that to the to labor and and almost the sexuality of the body, um, but clearly um, bound to rocks. Um, there is an actual tradition in which this um, piece is um, participating. And that's the tradition of the sort of the vanquished, if you will. Um, And that really is born from this uh, very famous monument of the four Moors that are on the bottom of this uh, statue, the lower figures. And they're, they're colossal figures. If anyone's ever been there, they're twice, maybe three times life-size figures, but they are four Moors. One of them is black, but the others are which is North African or what are these this Moor type types that um, represent the sort of fall of the Ottomans to the Italians. Um, uh, and, uh, and so this monument was so influential and so important because ca- so they're captives, right? They're captives that, that, that um, represent political power. And um, many uh, other representations of captives have drawn upon that aesthetic. And that's what we see here with this piece. Um, But here it is in the late 18th century, the abolitionist movement is beginning to heat up. I don't know uh, what the impetus is for this. Is this the impetus to to draw sympathy? Is this an abolitionist imagery? Is it part of a... um, a larger set that speaks to something like the four Moors. Uh, I know there was a female object that was with was part of this at one point. So it's very difficult to say, but um, it is in the li- lineage of this. And it is a way of attacking slavery um, in ways that we just are very unusual, I would say, uh, for porcelain. Um, so slavery. And so here it is, uh, it becomes um, a very important issue um, it, with the English and to a certain extent with the French at the end of the 18th century. The French have a more fraught relationship because they're in and out of uh, the slavery business. Um, but the English anti-slavery movement um, is a major, major um, thrust. So 
and and what what is the thing that that is probably the most you know important and influential object in uh, the history of this abolitionist movement is this, of course, Wedgwood medallion, anti slavery medallion that we've all seen, and it is uh, done in porcelain. So, um, it, so, so this notion of what can, what can porcelain do? Um, what can do the decorative arts do? Um, and, and in this case, uh, it, first of all, they can naturalize some very um, um, complicated relationships like the naturalization of the black body with sugar or coffee or as a servant, but they can also in this case be endlessly repeatable and manageable to put in your hand and something uh, it's easy to give away or pass around as a symbol. Um, and this one, am I not, that says, am I not a man and a brother was a very successful object that actually had a, a, an impact on the abolition of slavery. Um, particularly in England, but it was uh, in, we saw these creeping up in the United States. They, they became, they were manufactured in France by Sevres for a, a moment. And then they actually stopped manufacturing them because they felt that they, that the, uh, their version of the, me the met medallion would uh, upset uh, some of the um, stakeholders. So they, they manufactured a few and then they stopped. Um, manufacturing it. So that's that's a kind of interesting tidbit. But um, uh, these works could be um, make charms and women were wearing them as pins and you can pin it on your hat and, and it became part of this kind of identity. Um, and of course, the image has been talked about and talked about a lot because of its um, supplication. There's a supplicating chained black person who's begging for freedom um, as opposed to taking it themselves. I mean, so you're you're completely sort of dependent on, on the largesse of your masters or the white uh, the other white abolitionists to free you and asking asking them, am I not a man and a brother? Um, and not declaring. So I mean, there we, we can come along later and talk about all the things that um, are kind of wrong with this image, but um, it is it, something that worked. Uh, and I so so when I think about it in terms of this big bigger picture of the ornamental black, see this ornamental black person um, was part of the change, if you will. Um, so uh, the last sort of bit I want to talk about as I go into the 19th century um, is um, okay. What happens with slavery? So we do see slavery turning up. We see um, slaves turning up in uh, anti-slavery. Um, medallion, um, and that was reproduced all over teacups and plates and sugar bowls. And that was a sort of a, um, a obvious um, a tongue, in, not tongue in cheek, but obvious reference to slavery and those commodities. So that was very important. But there was also a, a, um, a, f a fictionalized world uh, of slavery. Um, and for some reason, Uncle Tom's Cabin, well, there's a lot of reasons, but Uncle Tom's Cabin becomes a um, very popular um, book in England and, in, and across Europe and in, in England and France. Um, it was, uh, as you probably already know, Uncle Tom's Cabin was the most popular book uh, in terms of sales in the 19th century in England, right next to the Bible, just under the Bible. So um, it is, also implicit, it comes along after the anti-slavery movement had been very um, much, uh, you know, uh, thriving in England and slavery had been abolished, but but in the, not in the United States. And it, and it gave this sort of compendium of, of caricatures and kind of caricatures, if you've ever read it, of, of slave types uh, that are coming out of the American South. But um, it becomes a really um, popular. And of course, these popular motifs um, popular styles, trends, fashionable things inevitably get co-opted into the world of, in this case, ceramics, because I won't insult um, you all by saying that the Staffordshire um, is uh, porcelain, and because I know it's earthenware, or, or uh, I, maybe Sequoia can put it in the chat exactly what you want to call it. But um, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about these things, I, I sort of collapse all these things. But I know that they're, it's very different. Porcelain is, is very different. But I still feel like it has the same 
impetus. Um, and it's certainly um, on the heels of this of the lu of luxury porcelain, making these objects more affordable and therefore um, um, more widely available. Um, but at any rate, Uncle Tom becomes a very important character that we see. So here is the Staffordshire Uncle Tom with Eva, and on the right you'll see the uh, illustration um, by Cruikshank, the English illustrator. Um, in uh, the English version of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And um, Uncle Tom was very passive. Uh, Uncle Tom was um, very religious and he struck up a friendship with uh, little Ava. And, it, and she almost treated him like a pet at one point. I mean, she, she was um, putting this garland of flowers around his neck out in a courtyard. Um, and he had been sold away from his family. It's a very terrible story, but here we find him in uh, St the Staffordshire Ware with the garland of flowers around his neck. So it's lit linking it to the story and his close relationship with little Ava. And of course, little Ava um, uh, ends up uh, passing away. Uh, it's all, it's very tragic. Um, but as, and at the end, I'm gonna be the spoiler here and Uncle Tom ends up being killed by the, um, the master for, for um, protecting other slaves. But um, the relationship between he and, and Lil Ava is very um, poignant and, and it, it's a, it was something that we find quite a bit um, in, in porcelain, um, in, in these uh, ceramic wares. Um, another group is uh, Topsy and Ava, these characters. Um, and it's interesting to see the black and white characters together in these uh, objects. Um, because um, I think there's something um, different about this Topsy and Ava than 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 the um, uh, the coffee the the, uh, the lady with Cavalier and her slave her servant serving coffee um, in the mice in peace. Um, even though Topsy is a slave, um, there's there's a sort of uh, reference to their their interesting relationship in the book. Um, and of course, um, they're just like any other stories that that get uh, co-opted into the world of ceramics and porcelain. They they get um, put, um, depicted in a sort of this transfer wares where, and this is a, a, a German company. So, but Uncle Tom was extraordinarily popular all over Europe. And this is the scene where um, Tom is being beaten uh, beaten to death on your. Your your floral uh, your dinner plate. Um, so again, these are I, I would say fictions of slavery that become extremely uh, interesting, and there it, it's a different kind of slavery than we found in the 18th century, which was more sort of exoticized and based on court culture. This is based on popular culture. I guess that's the big takeaway here. And I just couldn't not I could not not bring these in. I don't even know what to say. When I first saw them, I screamed, ah! But Limoges, <laughs> uh, again, very popular subject, little Uncle Tom and little Eva on the left in the garland. Uh, she's she's uh, lacing garland around his neck, this very poignant and touching relationship in these very over the top 19th century vases. Um, and on the right, which is a fascinating, is um, Eliza crossing the ice. There's another character in um, the book, Eliza, who is actually a slave herself, a light skinned woman and, uh, and her daughter who was like, she and her husband were both light skinned slaves. They were going to sell them. She escapes across the ice to freedom eventually. Um, and she's a, a popular character in the book. Um, and she is the, this set uh, of Limoges pieces is is re reproduced in many different versions. Um, and one of the things that uh, I talked about recently on a uh, in, uh, on a presentation about Majolica that was uh, that Sequoia joined me on was the fact that I uh, I found this Majo this Majolica piece they called figure group that I think it was really relates to this um, Eliza character but I don't think they read the book and understood um, one of the things about the Eliza character is that she she and her child looked white but they were still slaves these are kind of the dynamics that um, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe baked into that book was really interesting about all these different types. So you see a, a backwards piece of <laughs> in the middle of print referring to that same episode uh, and the, the Limoges piece on the right. So fictions of slavery, 
um, and different ways of, of understanding. And like I said, I'm pretty sure this whole crop, because you can even see the, the, on the left, the, the ice cracking underneath her feet. Um, that, but again, they just didn't understand the, um, the, the, the text or there is a collapsing of the idea of black. Black is just black and there's no way of, of, of making it in, in between. I, I don't know, I can't say. Um, but I thought I would leave you uh, with something a little bit more positive, if you will. Um, and because, um, you know, you think about were there any black people doing any of this uh, in the 19th century, few and far between. And I, I, I'm, I would say as, as many black people uh, that lived in England by the time the 19th century comes along, I'm sure there had to have been black people who worked at the factories. There just simply had to have been. Um, particularly um, in, in different kinds of labor. So, but we don't know who they are. But one person we do know is um, an African American uh, ex a slave, Eugene Warburg. Well, I don't know if he was ever actually a slave, but he was a he was a son of a white uh, wealthy white man from New Orleans who sent who who realized that that, that Eugene had a, a talent uh, and sent him to uh, England and to France to to work to study, and he was taken in by um, um, uh, abolitionists, et cetera. Um, at any rate, um, he created this piece, um, which was the follow-up, based on the follow-up to Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Dread. Um, and this, is a, he, this man is also a follow-up to um, Uncle Tom. They called him Uncle Tiff, or Old Tiff, who also befriended a young uh, white child and protected a young white child. But um, at least we, we know that there were, uh, and I think that to a certain extent, this is a, a sensitive rendering of Uncle Tom, as were some of the others, uh, because the text has him being very distorted and gnarly and everything like that. So um, there, there were a few um, instances where we might find African-American voices, um, um, weighing in. I don't know that this has anything to do with the big picture of, um, of ornamental blackness in terms of what he's conceiving, but, but to the struggles that African-Americans had to go through, even if your father was a wealthy white um, patron, um, still, we're still always there. And Warburg ends up dying in obscurity at some point um, in, 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 um, in England, I mean, in, in Italy. But I, um, and, and it was also very difficult to get trained um, at, at that point. But um, I thank you very much for, 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 for my, this opportunity and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions. Thank you, um, Adrian, for that fantastic talk. So wonderful to have a, um, an, an overview and a reintroduction to your, uh, to your thinking and your sets of ideas around this work, incredible. Um, uh, participants, I'd encourage you, if you do have questions, to add them to the Q&A function um, in Zoom. And maybe I'll get started by asking you a question, uh, Adrian, which is around uh, ceramics and porcelain in particular as a sort of as a specific medium. And your project of thinking through or unpacking ornamental blackness, as you mentioned at the beginning of the talk, really relates to representations of black bodies in, in a range of different media. And as you've been thinking about this, I'm, I'm wondering how you feel ceramics differs from say wood or silver or other materials in terms of its um, capacities or its tendencies uh, for, these, for these depictions. What's, what's different about ceramics or how are, how are black bodies depicted differently within porcelain or ceramics versus other media? Hmm. You know, that's, it's very interesting. Obviously ceramics um, uh, are essentially white or th at least the value is placed on those, the material that is, that is as white as it can be because that's one of the, the criteria, right? Uh, some of the uh, other darker media, um, you don't have the same um, con perception, right? So, so whiteness is, is a sense of uh, esteem and value in that. Um, and then, um, but it also is malleable and you can paint it, right? Um, and so what was, what's interesting to me um, is a, across a lot of different media, uh, in order to represent a black figure, there's just black paint or black, um, um, some kind of um, 
pigment of some sort, undifferentiated, <laughs> applied to it um, to represent uh, black figures. Um, and so in, in, in porcelain, it tends to be uh, very dense. It tends to be very shiny. Um, there tends to be a difficulty in figuring out how to deal with eyes and lips so that um, you get often these red or pink um, lips and, and, and they end up in looking very unnatural. Now, I remember when one of the discussions that we had at some point um, over the last couple of years, um, I thought I read somewhere that black was difficult um, pigment to achieve in porcelain. Um, but, and then someone else, someone told me that that's not necessarily true. Um, that looks that black didn't behave well in, mm. you know, um, so, so that to a, for Meissen to be able to achieve it um, was a show of their virtuosity uh, as opposed to really worry, really representing race in any way. It was more about trying to depict something uh, but I think that that whole story falls apart because <laughs> these racial figures were part of the uh, sort of imaginary, right? Um, but I, so I, I have to think about more about porcelain. I know there's a lot been, uh, that has been said about um, people, even figures like Uncle Tiff um, being uh, that it, that's Parian ware, um, and it's and it is necessarily white. Um, and so, how do you how do you reconcile that? Uh, those issues of whiteness and blackness in the same figure. Mm. Um, you know, I think of your comment of the of the kind of collapsing of, of blackness into these very kind of flat depictions mm -hmm. and the sort of this kind of overall like saturated blackness does mm -hmm. um, does absolutely feel like uh, like a caricature or like a, like a collapsing as you as you referenced with the um, Eliza character from Uncle Tom's Cabin. So when, in a way, I think it does, um, it, it very much does turn it into a type, as, as you're suggesting. Um, so we've ha we have a question about the uh, anti-slavery medallion, and uh, the question is asking you to um, go in a, a little bit more deeply about what's problematic around the anti-slavery medallion. Well, um, as we've looked back on this, um, the, should I put it up? Do you think? Should I bring it back up? No. Um, the, we'll the, pardon me? We can add a link to it. Oh, we can add a link, yes, to the, uh, it, that's one is at the Met. Um, the supplicating and the begging for freedom, as opposed, at a time when, let's say, the revolution in, in Santo Domingue that later becomes Haiti uh, is based on an uprising. It's a slave uprising. Uh, that, that it almost like uh, Blacks are, are not complicit or, or, or in their own freedom, that they are completely um, uh, dependent on the, the largesse, the, patriar the patriarchy. Uh, just like later when the slaves are emancipated in the United States, you have the figure of Lincoln freeing the slaves and there's a kneeling slave underneath him and his hand is above him. When um, anti-slavery in the United States from Frederick Douglass and others, there has been a lot of black participation in that. Even in England, there's there's a lot of uh, for, of those that have been able to get out or managed to avoid that system. Have, there's been a lot of black activism in terms of um, anti-slavery, in terms of abolition. So um, it doesn't account for for any of that. I, again, it's it's a patriarchal, um, patronizing view in some ways. Um, of that, but it it also elicits sympathy, and I think that was the that was the the uh, intent, and it worked. Um, so that's what. I'm, so so the, there's not there's not one way of thinking about it, but as we see throughout the whole 19th century, in terms of uh, representations of of, of abolitionist uh, sentiment, it's always beg, begging, begging, please, please, please. Uh, or somebody who's tied up, and 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 I guess that's again to get sympathy. But uh, as we look back on it, we see there is a patronizing element in that um, concept. Thank you for that. We um we have had a comment around the use of uh, usage of black as an enamel in early porcelain as being rare and not firing well. However, it is 
you know, found on quite a number of figures. Um, yeah. I think perhaps the missing ingredient is, is time, so that early on in the 18th century, it was perhaps more difficult to fire a reliable black, but as Meissen developed its technology over the 1730s, 40s, and 50s, it became more easily um, controllable and then um, more, more frequently used, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we've had a question um, around the, uh, the issue of gender in these depictions of blackness and enslavement in 18th century porcelain. And the question is around how um, black uh, male and female figures are sort of represented differently or used differently. Um, it's interesting. Most of the male figures are, ser or most of the servants, if you will, when they're related to a white figure or, 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 or the um, I'll say the master, whatever, um, are male. And there are females depicted in Meissen. Um, you saw the fe a female by the sugar bowl. Um, and then there are other female figures standing, figurines that are almost like Turkish market ladies that may be holding a bowl associated with some kind of food. Um, so, uh, and then the females are allegories. The allegory of Africa is a female. When you get into the 19th century, it, it, blow, it, it becomes a much wider in terms of what we, we find. Um, and then you have other types of uh, uh, other manufacturers getting into the game and, and um, you have allegorical figures, you have exotic negresses and, and, and all of that. Um, but they, they all follow a certain types, they certain types. Um, and then the, the female servant, um, I, that is a, a, is also a, associated with the female, like in a bath or something like that. But I don't know about that in porcelain. I haven't seen that as much. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to read the next question, uh, which comes from Ezra Shales. And it says, uh, in considering varying degrees of agency in these artifacts and art, do you think museums should show these stove-based figurines or not? What sort of contextualization would be constructive? For instance, if a runaway enslaved person gave the Staffordshire figurine of Eliza to someone helping them on the Underground Railroad North, would that make the ornamental whiteness less toxic for today's viewers? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. And I think they, they can be shown and they can, particularly when they're associated with a literary tome like, the, like um, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's an important book and it's complicated. Um, but it was also very popular. So I think you can show it. I think it takes a lot of um, um, interpretation. And there were, and, and, and Stowe's initial, I mean, Stowe's impetus is, is, is anti-slavery. So um, you have to take that into account, but, but Stowe doesn't make these figures. People, these, these different manufacturers get in the game and they, they start doing popular themes and then they become corrupt when I say corrupted, not, you know, in, in the sense that they change and morph and, and those initial intentions get lost in some other issues of how, how it's made and who's making it and, how, you know, and who's painting it. Um, and I think you can unpack all of that. Yes, I think it's, I think we have to show these things. Yes. Great. And yes, uh, I think you can look at them as, uh, you know, as an, as in terms of, way people at some time points come together across racial lines. This Actually, this question of coming together um, speaks to our next question, which I'll, I'll go ahead and read as well. It's from Julie Hollenbach, and she says, I'm struck by how these porcelain objects might have had the power to organize and structure space. I'm curious about the relationship between these representations of enslaved people in porcelain and the actual enslaved Black people who may have shared space with them as domestic workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that I think about, um, and um, and and I I th I think about it in, in terms of if someone is cleaning these objects, um, someone is putting flowers in the vase or filling a sugar bowl. Um, there are candlesticks. Someone is lighting the candlesticks or cleaning the wax that drips over the candlesticks. Um, they are, and, and how bodies move around in the spaces, particularly where you'll find maybe large objects in, in some of like Majolica objects, some of them are, the Moors were six feet tall uh, and they're bigger than the people that own them, right? Um, and, and the people who may have been working around them. So, um, uh, you know, that it, 
trying to figure out how a person would have thought takes a, a bit of critical fabulation, as they call it. Now, um, and my my book um, that I'm writing, I, I always I think about doing that. I think about, well, I should probably start projecting on what this might mean, but it's a survey at this point, and I don't want to necessarily do that. I leave that up to the contemporary artists to reimagine what it might have meant. Um, but there, these are these uh, objects were so naturalized to a certain extent that I wonder how conscious anybody was um, about. But on the other hand, um, you you when you see yourself represented in in a uh, utilitarian object, and you you too are a utilitarian object. Um, that that is a that is the tension that that I try to bring out at least in discussing it, but we don't know who what's because of the histories are so collapsed we don't know what servants are in what what spaces and it's hard to project. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to wrap up with uh, one one final question, um, which comes from Wendy Garris and sorry apologies for not being able to get to all the questions. And um, when Jay's asking about the uh, sexualization or the eroticization of many of these figures, mm -hmm. she notes that many of the um, Chinese and Asian figures as well were often stereotyped and fetishized and sexualized. And she's asking whether you've come across any homoerotic figures in either male or female figures. Mm. That's interesting. Um, because especially if it's a it's a standalone figure. I guess that the homoeroticism comes in the desire of the person who owns it or is encountering it. Or um, so I have to think about that. But I do feel like, um, especially with objects that are these blackamoors, like you call Venetian, uh, you may think of them as these Venetian kinds of life-size figures that are holding up lanterns and candles in the corner. Uh, are very muscular and very shiny. Um, and, um, and I think that kind of shine ref reflects the kind of um, shine that, that um, Africans were, were sh oiled up on slave uh, blocks to attract ownership. And it also reflects the shine of um, lacquer because <laughs> they're a lot uh, so it's the material and whether or not the the intention is to to make them reflect that the kind of um shine that attracts owners i i don't know that that is true but it's a it it, it is a it is a aesthetic that kind of goes across the centuries and it, it's almost like a a, a very poignant or, or a telling coincidence if you will um that shine and and rippling musculature um, is something that attracts people to buy the object, attracts people to buy the people. Um, so I think that's a safe connection to make. Uh, but at any rate, I think that there certainly in slave auctions, slave per there's there are homoerotic, um, I think, aspects of, of those of that practice um, that might be able to you might be able to extend to the practice of buying and collecting these kinds of objects. But again, it depends on the character them, themselves. And certainly when we get to the lat, lat, late 19th, early 20th century with sort of neo-Baroque, neo uh, there's a Baroque revival in, in theater and dance, you know, there's Scheherazade and, and, and the dancing of the Moors and many, that is another ornamental blackness that, that uh, is very, very homoerotic when, when it comes to sort of performance in the early 20th century. Mm, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I've gone off the rails. <laughs> no, not at all. For, it's fantastic. Yeah, so um, wonderful. Of uh, Telling coincidence, I think, is a phrase that stands out for me of what you were just speaking. No, really, because the sort of the, the relationships of these kind of rip, rippling and glimmering and whatnot. So, um, Adrian, thank you so much for uh, for your talk today and for spending time with us and for um, uh, you know opening up your ideas for for all of us. It's really been wonderful. Um, thank you, much much appreciated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will uh, say that um, our next virtual lecture at the Gardner will be on Thursday, May nineteenth. Um, it is titled "I Conceive That It Shortens Their Lives: Working Conditions in Nineteenth-Century Staffordshire Potteries." The presenter will be Miranda Goodby, um, curator at the uh, Potteries Museum. 
in Staffordshire and uh, registration information will be up on our website shortly. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you again, Dr. Childs and um, onward. Thank you so much.